Chapter Eight of Book One of Les Misérables, Volume Two, by Victor Hugo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. Les Misérables, Volume Two, by Victor Hugo. Translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood. Book First, Waterloo. Chapter Eight. The Emperor puts a question to the guide Lacoste. So on the morning of Waterloo, Napoleon was content. He was right. The plan of battle conceived by him was, as we have seen, really admirable. The battle once begun, its very various changes, the resistance of Hougomont, the tenacity of La Haye Sainte, the killing of Baudouin the disabling of Foix, the unexpected wall against which Soie's brigade was shattered, Guillaumino's fatal heedlessness when he had neither petard nor powder-sacks, the miring of the batteries, the fifteen unescorted pieces overwhelmed in a hollow way by Uxbridge, the small effect of the bombs falling in the English lines and there embedding themselves in the rain-soaked soil, and only succeeding in producing volcanoes of mud, so that the canister was turned into a splash. The uselessness of Pierre's demonstration on braine la all that cavalry, fifteen squadrons, almost exterminated. The right wing of the English badly alarmed, the left wing badly cut into. Ney's strange mistake in massing instead of echeloning the four divisions of the First Corps. Men delivered over to grape-shot, arranged in ranks twenty-seven deep, and with a frontage of two hundred. The frightful holes made in these masses by the cannon-balls. Attacking columns disorganised, the side-battery suddenly unmasked on their flank. Bourgeois, Danzelot, and Durut compromised, Kio repulsed. Lieutenant Vieux, that Hercule graduated at the Polytechnic School, wounded at the moment when he was beating in with an axe the door of La Haye Sainte under the downright fire of the English barricade, which barred the angle of the road from Genappe to Brussels. Marconnier's division, caught between the infantry and the cavalry, shot down at the very muzzle of the guns amid the grain by best and pack put to the sword by Ponsonby. His battery of seven pieces spiked. The Prince of Saxe-Weimar holding and guarding, in spite of the Comte d'Erlon, both Frichemont and Smoin, the flag of the hundred and fifth taken, the flag of the forty-fifth captured. That black Prussian hussar stopped by runners of the flying column of three hundred light cavalry, on the scout between Wavre and Plancenois, the alarming things that had been said by prisoners. Grouchy's delay, fifteen hundred men killed in the orchard of Hougomont in less than an hour, eighteen hundred men overthrown in a still shorter time about La Haye Sainte. All these stormy incidents, passing like the clouds of battle before Napoleon, had hardly troubled his gaze, and had not overshadowed that face of imperial certainty. Napoleon was accustomed to gaze steadily at war. He never added up the heart-rending details, cipher by cipher. Ciphers mattered little to him, provided that they furnished the total victory. He was not alarmed if the beginnings did go astray, since he thought himself the master and the possessor at the end. He knew how to wait, supposing himself to be out of the question, and he treated destiny as his equal. He seemed to say to fate, Thou wilt not dare. Composed half of light and half of shadow, Napoleon thought himself protected in good, and tolerated in evil. He had, or thought that he had, a connivance, one might almost say a complicity, of events in his favour, 
which was equivalent to the invulnerability of antiquity. Nevertheless, when one has Berezina, Leipzig, and Fontainebleau behind one, it seems as though one might distrust Waterloo. A mysterious frown becomes perceptible in the depths of the heavens. At the moment when Wellington retreated, Napoleon shuddered. He suddenly beheld the tableland of Mont Saint Jean cleared, and the van of the English army disappear. It was rallying, but hiding itself. The Emperor half rose in his stirrups. The lightning of victory flashed from his eyes. Wellington, driven into a corner at the forest of Soigne, and destroyed, that was the definitive conquest of England by France. It was Crécy, Poitiers, Malplaquet, and Ramilly avenged. The man of Marengo was wiping out. Agincourt. So the Emperor, meditating on this terrible turn of fortune, swept his glass for the last time over all the points of the field of battle. His guard, standing behind him with grounded arms, watched him from below with a sort of religion. He pondered. He examined the slopes, noted the declivities, scrutinized the clumps of trees, the square of rye, the path. He seemed to be counting each bush. He gazed with some intentness at the English barricades of the two highways. Two large abattis of trees, that on the road to Genap above La Haie Sainte, armed with two cannon, the only ones out of all the English artillery which commanded the extremity of the field of battle and that on the road to Nivelle, where gleamed the Dutch bayonets of Chasse's brigade. Near this barricade he observed the old chapel of Saint-Nicolas, painted white, which stands at the angle of the cross-road near braine la He bent down and spoke in a low voice to the guide Lacoste. The guide made a negative sign with his head, which was probably perfidious, the Emperor straightened himself up, and fell to thinking. Wellington had drawn back. All that remained to do was to complete this retreat by crushing him. Napoleon, turning round abruptly, dispatched an express at full speed to Paris, to announce that the battle was won. Napoleon was one of those geniuses from whom thunder darts. He had just found his clap of thunder. He gave orders to Milo's cuirassier to carry the tableland of Mont Saint Jean. End of Book First, Chapter Eight. Recording by Ruth Golding.